cover some of the points that I think we probably need to discuss a bit more this morning. So I'm going to be a bit harder on us as placemakers. Um, I'm not going to be depressing, I hope. I'm going to be positive. But it's about owning something um, as placemakers. Um, we talked about gentrification and various other things, but I'll just start with kind of why I'm here today, and I think most of you are. So it's a confession that I don't make at dinner parties, but my background is environmental law. So I used to work on law and human rights, and I found myself actually doing placemaking over the last 15 years. Hadn't quite realized it because I was working around environmental justice. But when me and the team looked together and talked to our clients and our funders, we realized we were actually trying to create better places. That's what it's about. And we dropped the language of environmental justice because that wasn't the language that policymakers were using. It wasn't the language that communists were using. And it wasn't the language that developers were using either. Placemaking was the thing that we were looking at. Now, as Michael said, I work for Living Space Project, not Living Streets. Um, and if I had a title for this particular conversation, I hope we have, it would be place make, the placemaking factor, disrupting gentrification, the bad kind. And I think we heard about the bad kind this morning. But actually, if we're honest, I don't think it's the right word, but we're using gentrification anyway. It has a lot of problems with that. But actually, some of the elements of gentrification, that is improving a local neighborhood or a city or an area, is actually a good thing. Just let's forget the word gentrification for a moment because that is problematic. Not only is it problematic because we look at it as a way in which people get moved out by the rich, which is true, and therefore, of course, we don't want to say that we work in gentrification. But we do work in a very political field. I was listening to a podcast the other day, um, 2016 podcast, that was quite interesting, by the BBC. And it was about placemaking. So I was kind of interested to see what a non-placemaker, a journalist, made of us. This is what he described what we do. Placemaking is a buzzword. What they do is focus an eye to the look and the feel of a neighborhood to make it more attractive. That's nice, isn't it? We make things more attractive. Well, we do, and no apologies for that. But what we do is highly political. And I haven't heard that discussed enough when placemakers get together. We are talking about social justice. We are talking about equality. And we are talking about how we meet the challenge of an urbanized world in both the north and the south of the hemisphere. There is a global discussion going on around placemaking. And I think a number of organizations that have spoken already, KDF, um, STEPO, NL, PPS, and others, have been involved in this conversation at a very global level, at UN level, UN Habitat level. And it's worth looking at that because, actually, I think what the UN noticed and the debate globally, internationally, amongst communities and professionals was that place is political. And we have a sustainable development goal. Do most of you know what that is? OK. I'll presume the silence is a yes. So um, ask me later if you're too scared to do it now. So SDG 11, it's a sustainable development goal, and it's the one for cities. And it's a catalyst for urban change. It talks about inclusive, resilient, and safe places for all. Not the few, not the rich, not just the poor, not just for men, not just for adults, not just for women, but for all. That is a tall order for all of us. Inclusive and resilient. So how do we do that? Well, I think one of the things we do is just own what we do. I don't want to be working around a buzzword. I don't think any of you really do either, because I don't think that's what we do. 
if we're going to tackle gentrification, we need to recognize a couple of things and talk about it and own it. And when we're talking to our clients and the communities we work with, bringing these things into the conversation. What we do is build assets. We try and build assets. They are economic and they are social. They are financial and they are non-financial. Some of the things we can't put a price on, well, actually, I think if we had some economists in the room, they could. Well-being, for example. Well, we do lots of sums in the UK around well-being. A healthy person living near to a park will mean a certain amount of less money spent, um, a lower budget for the NHS, for example. One of the things that I sometimes do when I'm thinking about place making into the future is I look into the, the past. And there is a really good book called Shape of Communities. And I came across it at Richard Rogers' exhibition about five years ago. And I don't know if you know Richard Rogers. is an architect and actually, although he doesn't call himself a placemaker, talks about creating inclusive cities, small cities, cities that work for people and the environment that are fair. In this book, um, Shape of Communities, it talks about actually cities about building assets, economic and social value. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? I'm going to give a few examples about how some organizations, some cities are trying to do that. And we'll all have a different way of dealing with it. We'll all have our own framework, our own door to walk through to create these inclusive, resilient cities that create assets. Now, one of my um, roles, can I drink this water? Has anybody else drunk it? Well, we're friends anyway, I'll take the risk. <laughs> right, no, it tasted okay. Um, so, I'm also on the London Sustainable Development Commission. Big word, and actually quite a big agenda. But the reason why I'm there is because sustainable development is actually what we do as well, isn't it? It's a sweet spot between the environment, economy, thank you, and society. Do you know something about what was in the other cup? <laughs> you do. We're all friends. It's okay. Um, and we've got a new mayor, Sadiq Khan. You might have heard of him. And one of the things that he has pushed is the fact that as an international city, a leading city as a capital, I think most cities like to think they're leading, but London possibly is, or has the potential to. He wants to create a city which is based around good growth. I'm again looking for nodding heads, but you just think it's another strap line. Possibly, possibly not. Good growth is really about good economics, and that doesn't mean growth for any reason. It doesn't mean lots of money in the bank for the sake of having lots of money in the bank. It's not just about profit. Good growth is a little bit like the donut economy kind of overview, is that the economy is not there just to grow and create money and create money for the few but it's also to look at the needs of the many. So good growth only happens not through profits or not through economic assets that the GLA or others might build into their bank account, but it happens by how much you do that meets the needs of the people living in London. So for London, good growth means regeneration that creates social housing. Do you remember that one, social housing? Actually, a lot of you put your hands up and you're not from England, so you most certainly do. Um, but you will probably know that certainly in the UK and certainly England, some of the bigger cities, social housing is massive. It is a big part of regentrification. We have a lot of private housing, very expensive, and a lot less social housing. To me, that's not good placemaking, and it certainly isn't good growth. So it's a watchful eye about a strategy that is actually very inclusive around placemaking. And the mayor has made statements around good growth is a placemaking agenda 
Now, I think that's kind of interesting and vaguely exciting when the mayor of a major city says that and seems to be coming up with the goods. He's recently put together a regeneration good growth fund of, I think, 2.6 million, is that right? Um, potentially for 27 projects. I know you're going to say that's probably not enough, but it's a starting point, and it's a starting point that some of the cities might not have even got to. So we have assets. We have an inclusive, resilient city for all and not just the few. So to my mind already, that is something which means it is an agenda which works on a political level. In the UK, we're doing a lot of looking at placemaking. It is a bit of a buzzword, um, as the journalist said, but it's not been described as the journalist that I mentioned did. I've done, the past 25 years, lots of research in policy and community hub projects, seeing how they run at a community level. And I think I've never quite seen an interest, certainly in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, so the whole of the UK, around placemaking. We have a massive grant-making sector, foundation and philanthropists, now opening up place-making funding programs. And the reason why I think this is really interesting is because I think when you bring philanthropy to the table or organizations or individuals interested in social justice, that turns around some of the focus around place. So again, it's not just about creating towns and cities that only a few people can live in, but asking some difficult questions around social justice and creating solutions to them. There is the big lottery foundation fund, um, which is lottery money. Um, who are redesigning their whole organization around place-led funding, all of it at a regional level. It's not been done before. Esme Fairburn, for the Fairburn Foundation, another organization that's begun a place-making program. And there are others. And I think it's really interesting because they are looking at how we how they, as philanthropists, invest better in place. And some of the research we've been doing is looking at actually what would place look like and how would we tackle gentrification if what we did was create places that were collectively funded and collectively designed. And by collectively funded, we mean take private sector money, or we'll take public sector money, but we also want to make sure that philanthropists are at the table. But it's not just those three groups either. What we found works is when places are designed with communities not only in mind, but also at the table. There's going to be a workshop later in the afternoon about how we do this better because we keep asking ourselves questions. Why aren't communities more involved? Well, I could tell you, if you ask me to come up to a meeting at 6.30 in the afternoon, in the evening, sorry, having two children, I think I would tell you I had other things to do. Maybe in your countries you do it better than we sometimes do, but actually what we need to do to make sure communities actually do feel involved in this whole discussion, and they are the experts as much as we ever are, is making sure that you are there with them where they are. So there's something about how we design the way that we have conversations with, with communities, and we don't do it as well as we could. And I think what's happening is that grant makers are actually asking more of communities, getting community involvement. The other thing is, you would say possibly that gentrification is not about creating a humane city, wouldn't you? I mean, I would. A humane city um, is built as if people matter. Gentrification is built as if money and buildings matter. That is not what we're about. And so we do need other structures we need new economic structures, new ways of funding. We need collaborative working. But as placemakers, we need to be asking questions about the politics 
that we have at the national and international level, and, and the local level too. I don't think that you can be a placemaker and not understand the policy framework that you're working in. And I don't think that any of us can be really good placemakers unless we understand what policies need to be changed, which policies are there that get in the way of what we do. And the big issue is planning. So in the UK, we've had so many changes around planning law. And the planning law, as you know, for most countries, was about actually creating better neighbourhoods. It's always been about that. But slowly, drip by drip, planning has become, in many people's eyes, for developers. How does a planning structure become easier to build? How do you take away the rights of a community to have their say about what comes into their neighbourhood. And so we are looking more and more at how we get back the planning system that we need. There is something called the Planning Rainsford Review, and it's a national planning framework. And if anyone hasn't heard of that, it's worth looking at. It's a group of organisations and individuals run by the TCPA, the Town and Country Planning Association, who are looking at how do we bring back a policy framework that actually supports placemaking and not gentrification. So, if this is an action call for placemakers, and I think we're all here to create change and social change, then I'm going to just tell you a couple of things that, that I think we need to be comfortable with. Okay, so place is political. We are not only designers and architects and environmentalists. We are political beings. <laughs> what we do makes a difference at the political level. It is not just about nice designs. We are not just a buzzword. And we need to illustrate that. I came across a statement or something that Jeanette Sadiq Khan said, and she's a former, you probably know, she wrote some Street Fight and she did so much around transportation in New York. The thing is, being political is absolutely fine. But it's not, she said, it's not about saying no to new developments. That's not enough. We need cities' agendas to say yes to. So we need to be part of creating the alternatives to what we don't like or what we see as problematic. The next thing is lead by asking difficult questions. Like we have a number of clients, and they're from the developing world, like as in developers. They're also from the developing and European world, north and south. And we have communities, and we have grant makers and architects. But when they come to us, we do ask, what do you mean by placemaking? Um, is it that you, what do you want for this space? Because you need to know from the very beginning whether you're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution. That answer they give you tells you, can you help change their perspective? if it's just about beautifying something to put the prices up in an area? Or is it actually providing an alternative or just saying, no, we can't work with you because this is what we think placemaking is. I know, it's a recession. That might feel difficult, but try it. The other thing is, when you're working, who do you really collaborate with? Do you really work with the communities that you want to work with? Do they, do they really reflect the communities that you work in? I mean, I'm stood here and I'm thinking, I could point out the obvious. Um, we're not particularly diverse. Age. Race. Culture, possibly. I know it's not just about the viewing. Actually, probably if I asked you all questions, it is diverse, diverse in many other ways. 
Well, I think it's difficult to have the answers if you don't have all the right people around the table. So, how do we collaborate more in a way that is inclusive rather than just asking for inclusive placemaking? Finally, when I wrote this book, it's uh, a book, it's about four years' work looking at research on placemaking. And again, it's called The Placemaking Factor a catalyst for disrupting environment and social grant making. It was aimed at grant makers. But nonetheless, I think we are disruptors. And I think most of all, we need to realize that in the future, this is going to be unsettling. Because gentrification, its worst kind, is not going to go away unless we actively fight it. It's unsettling, but it's crucial. And it's crucial for growth, and it's crucial for progress, and it's certainly absolutely crucial for inclusive cities. I'll stop there. So we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Go on, challenge me. Say something. Hi, Maria. Um, my name's Chris Common brown I'm from London, work for Borgate Estates. Hello. Hello. Um, really interested for you to tell the group um, the message you give to developers when they come to you and say, help us with placemaking. Um, what do you say you want them to do? That's a good question. So, um, first of all, we would have done a bit of research on you. But the second thing is... Um, you know, we are inclusive, so we do let everyone through the door. And I, I think we, we point fingers at developers when we needn't do. But I think the question would be that first one. What is it that you want from placemaking? What's your project? What are the benefits it's going to bring, economic and social? And who are you willing to work with? And what's your long-term and short-term agenda for this? That's what I would say. We're not afraid of developers wanting to make profit. That's fine. I mean, we all want to do that at some point. That doesn't mean you can't be a good business or care. But that's the questions we ask developers. And then we have a suite of different tools, and we work out which works best for them, depending on their development and what they want to get out of it, but crucially, the assets that they will leave for the communities and tenants in those developments. And we had another person over here. Yeah. Hi, um, <clears throat> I found it really interesting, so thanks uh, for, for the talk, and it's exactly the kind of approach that um, um, we at Bids Belgium and Belgium Design Council take. And I wanted to ask you how much of it, in your view, is about redesigning democracy? Because Sadiq Khan, obviously, there's inclusion there at a systemic level, mm -hmm. but so much of it is systemic exclusion when it comes to municipality governments, national, regional. Just wanted your views on that. Um, yeah, it is systemic. It absolutely is, and that's why I think um, this thing about we make things look nice is ridiculous. Um, it's, it's political, as I said before, but it's very much <laughs> systemic in the sense that we are dealing with some of the social problems of exclusion and poverty um, and wealth that isn't shared. So yes, it is. And I think owning up to that is really important. And plotting which things are at the top of the worst systemic problems that you could, as an organization, a municipality, a local authority or government, start to deal with. And so for DCOM, it's equality. One more question. Hello, um, Ness Happy uh, Odile from Anglia Ruskin University. Um, you mentioned social justice, equality, and the challenges of an urbanizing world yeah. as being the key kind of political issues that placemaking uh, needs to face up to. Um, and I'm just wondering whether uh, the notion of spatial justice is one that placemakers should be developing more as a kind of leading concept to inform what we do and how we do it. Um, what are your, your views about that? Well, my first view is yes, absolutely. Um, I think there is an issue around spatial justice about who owns it. 
Um, I think there's an issue as well about um, the quality of a space, um, the sense of a place when people go there. I think spatial justice is very much connected to the environmental justice agenda that I was talking about earlier. And I am hoping that everyone in this room is looking at that as an issue, whether you're a developer, or an academic, or someone working for local governments or private sector. Spatial justice is a crucial part of placemaking. If you don't actually address it, you are not creating a solution. You are just moving the wheel around and creating the same problem as before. Great, thank you, Maria. Thank you.